Hey folks, Michael here with the CCERP podcast, Cypress Creek Ecological Restoration Project. Back again. Today, a new topic. We've been doing a bunch of um, kind of rewilding yourself, um, thinking about your ecology and your own nature. And today it's a little bit about nature itself. We need to learn more about that. Um, you know, we got some mistakes we make, every human being does, just like uh, we might think of development as improving the land. You put down concrete, you put up a building, things are better, but it's not always the case. we got to think about what's good for nature, what's good for us, um, how things work at their best, how do we work at our best, what's a good environment for us. Um, and living along the creek, we got that to consider. We got a creek. We got the animals there. We got the plants there. Um, of course, as you know, unfortunately, our creek floods. Um, Hurricane Harvey, a lot of flooding we had before that. Seems like it happened two or three times a year for a while there. Um, but we got to think about, you know, because of that, we want, you know, got the animals, the plants, the flooding. What makes a healthy creek? Um, what's a good thing to do so it's better all around so we can minimize flooding and of course injury death loss of property um loss of wealth um and have a creek that we live along that functions best for all involved so um today we're going to talk about someone who knows about that bob freitag uh bob could you introduce yourself my name is Bob Freitag, and I uh, teach at the University of Washington. I'm a senior instructor, and I'm the director of the Hazard Mitigation Center. Uh, I've been here 20 years. I can't believe it, but uh, 20 <laughs> years. I teach uh, classes in floodplain management, hazardous mitigation, uh, which really addresses earthquakes and wildland fires currently. That's our, hmm. our big interest area here. Uh, and, uh, of course, on resilience, community resilience. So I've taken a deep dive into that and learning a lot. Before I came here, I'm going to have to talk really softly. I think I'm losing my voice. I'm going to have water. Uh, uh, before I came here, I worked for FEMA. I was the federal uh, coordinating officer with FEMA, Region 10. So I was the fellow that when there was a disaster, would go to the disaster and coordinate federal activities uh, for the disaster. My hmm. background, uh, so I was there 25 years. And I, while I was with FEMA, I was the... Uh, federal coordinating officer. I was the public assistance officer. I was the education officer as I kind of worked up the, the food chain. And uh, I left. I had a, a very responsive, fun job, uh, but I would be out eight months. So hmm. that creates a little havoc with your family and friends. <laughs> Slightly. So they gave me an opportunity to retire early, and I did. Uh, before, before I went to FEMA, I worked for a uh, consultant firm in uh, – Australia. And we looked really at Newtown planning and I became exposed to hazards uh, when they had uh, a huge cyclone hit Darwin. Hmm. And we did not get the contract, but I worked a lot on the contract. So when I came back from uh, Australia, I, uh, I kind of sought that field out and took a job with FEMA before it was FEMA to show you. Hmm how long that was. Uh, I started out this whole process and I think we're getting to the end of it, but the, as a school teacher. So my first degree cool. is in elementary education, science education. And so I was a school teacher and uh, was uh, the only job I could have after a while was intermediate school. And I uh, did not like intermediate school kids. <laughs> I have to, I have to say that when I was, when I, when yeah. I was in my twenties, now I, I tried to go back when I left FEMA, I, I, instead of going to the university, I tried to get a, a job here and uh, as a school teacher. And I was told I had to go back to school to become certified. They were absolutely correct with that, but um, I didn't, so I went to the university. So that kind of gives <laughs> my my history in, a, in a, a nutshell. So now you get to deal with old third graders. No, I, deal with, I, I use the same techniques, by the way, and the same <laughs> class techniques and uh, with graduate students. And it... Uh, Works well. I had one graduate. I, I do a lot of storytelling, and I had hmm. one graduate student that 
had a very diff difficult time with that. And by storytelling, I mean that we would, uh, you know, set a stage and then we would tell a story. And stories are driven by conflict and change. And that was a flood or, or an earthquake or something. And they would introduce that change to a community that they liked and could describe. And then they figured a way to, to resolve the, the, the change in a story format, really making it very, fairly personal. Uh, and it's worked out very well, but there was one one student, you know, who said, my gosh, this, this is silly and it's, we're not being, you know, as uh, direct as we should and as serious as we should. So I would have done that. Um, hmm. Where my interest lies currently is really, uh, and very broadly, and I think it, it addresses what you're dealing with is how you live in a dynamic environment. So mm -hmm. if the problem that we've had as people is we like to build something and then we go on to something else now that's that's fairly recent uh hmm. you know indig indigenous populations would build uh mobile homes and or mobile settings and they would shift as the environment shifted and they, they could live fairly well in a dynamic environment but we like to put a house there and we make it out of concrete even when we made it out of wood we had a foundation for it we didn't really hmm. relish the the opportunity to to move at different places so I've kind of summarized most of the problems we have are we have a, a stream or a water course or some environment that is very dynamic and it should be dynamic. And it, the stream should go from, you know, from one side to the next side. It goes from fine sediments really, or really uh, from uh, fine sediments to coarse sediments and it, it, it moves. And so as it's meandering, it should be allowed to. And uh, plants along the side of it, the riparian areas and the hyperuric areas, uh, they evolve and uh, they should evolve. So, uh, and we like to make them, we, we want to make that subdivision right next to the river. And we all know, <laughs> we all know of subdivisions <clears throat> where they, they try to meander the river and, and harden it and make it into an open channel. And, and they have homes on both sides and that's the way they want it to be. And uh, it, it, the self-correcting nature uh, of just our environment is wonderful to, to witness. Ours is not self-correcting, our built environment. And so how do we have this self-correcting landscape uh, where trees grow and they fall in and then they, the environments change? Uh, and we have a very hard time, very hard time with that. Hmm, interesting. And you know... <sighs> It's, I was thinking of a lot of stuff while you were saying that. So it's like, where do I go from here? But it's interesting talking about um, people wanting to control rivers. In some ways, that comes up in other aspects of the culture, just like we want to control kids. Instead of just as people don't want to let rivers be rivers, mm -hmm. they don't want to let kids be kids. And that has a detrimental effect. So that's like something good people can think about is like, okay, if you have kids sit um, eight hours a day in school and not move and take away their recess, so allegedly they can be start s smarter by studying more, and they're just going to sit when they get home, and they sit in a car oh, and no. sit at the table. Um, look what's happening. Obesity, um, dysfunction, um, they're not really getting smarter. Um, they're not able to focus as well because they're not moving. So people need to, and then people need to learn to let that, to learn to live with chaos and dynamism, kind of controlled chaos and dynamism um, with kids. If we want them to be healthy and we care and we love our kids and our friends in the future. Um, and you can take that and I think apply that to the creeks and oh, yeah. streams and rivers. It's like, and, yeah, and, if I can kind of build on that, the uh, I, I, I think that uh, you know kids, including my my, my adult students, uh, they are. We have a population that doesn't connect with the outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether they think it's a video game or whatever, <laughs> but they're, but but they're not connecting with the outdoors. I've had I've had classes, and every class that I teach, we have a, a class product or project where we have to look at the. At the uh, at the stream, we have to see where it's going. We have to kind of feel and smell it. And uh, I've had I had this one class, and at the end of the class, and I should have known better. I said, well, "What did you think of the stream?" Well, they they hadn't visited. 
Well, it's only about 20 miles away. And they said, why should we? We have ortho photos. We have some GIS layers. <laughs> we, I mean, I can't see any reason. And so then I'm going wow. to end this. But uh, it reminds me, Pat, uh, Pat Suzuki, who was uh, Canadian, who when I grew up had a, a TV show, and I think uh, where he had, we had only had, you know, five stations then or three major stations. And he said that, you know, uh, somebody asked him, well, what, you know, what do you feel about the uh, discussion of wildlife and nature that's over public media? And he said, well, when I was uh, younger in, in the 60s and maybe up in, even into the 70s and early 80s, I had uh, one show. I had one show a week. We had three stations. And in the evening, I was one third of the, of the audience. And we talked about evolution. We talked about the importance. Uh, and we did a deep dive into nature. And he says, now, you know, we have a thousand stations just all over. The, and we don't have any real nature shows that talk about it or have a deep dive. We have uh, shows where the, you know, the, the animal fights or uh, <laughs> uh, the mm -hmm. cutest animals or <laughs> the prettiest animals or... But in Trump's, uh, and, and, and people are not talking about the relationships. Ecology is all about relationships and uh, mm -hmm. between the natural environment and between the you know, parts of the natural environment, the, the, the geology and the biology. And uh, we just don't have those discussions. And so students are becoming illiterate in terms of their relationship to nature. And it's, it's very sad. And it shows up in the classroom. I mean, people... People complain about just having students that can write, and I think students write well. They write differently now, and, and the progression that I've seen, they, you know, they're they're crisp sentences, <laughs> which are very good, but the thoughts don't evolve. I mean, it, it's like they're they're trying to do a, a, a you know a text for Twitter or something, and they want to get the thought out in you know 120 characters or something. But in terms of a deep dive, it's it's just more difficult. And as I said, I just, uh, it's, it's just, there's not the understanding between the physical environment and the biological environment. Hmm, yeah. And, or, or the, curi uh, the, uh, the curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a teacher, so I know so, what you mean, unfortunately. Oh, it's, it's terrible. <sighs> but that reminds me of one movie. I forgot what it was. Robin Williams, I think. If it's him, he was a teacher. Um, if it's the right movie, but, um, might've been in that, that captain or captain movie. Um, but it's not ringing a bell. I was, uh, yeah, I was but, thinking of goodwill hunting actually when you, were talking. yeah, it might, yeah, it might be that or some other, I can't remember, but I know there's, um, forget which movie it is, but one character is talking about, um, seeing the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like you said, yeah, I saw it. Like, um, no, that's, I saw that a picture. Was, was that what? was Goodwill Hunting. That was okay. Goodwill Hunting. Right? Yeah, and then I, remember the I scene. Remember that. Then he says, yeah. "No, you haven't, like until you've been there, you don't know the Sistine Chapel. You got to go there and feel it, and smell what it's like, and see see it on different lighting throughout the day, and all this stuff. It's like same thing with nature. It's not just seeing it on video or pictures. It's like." Totally different. You got to go there. And in terms of, you know, when you were talking, it, it reminded me of some research that was done on Yellowstone. And I think it was done by a, a Davis professor by the name of Ripple. And I'm probably going to correct myself after the podcast is over. But, <laughs> yeah, I did that. But, but he was looking at wolves and uh, it, coming out of Yellowstone. He was looking at a stream. And he was studying kind of the same streams over many, many years. And the streams that he was studying, he so studied initially were uh, fairly warm. Uh, they had a lot of sediment in them. Uh, they had the, the fish count was very low. Oxygen level was very low. And they just were not healthy streams. By healthy streams, I mean that they were not self-correcting organisms, really, uh, that evolved with the landscape. So, but then he noticed over a period of time, the streams became... Uh, more vegetated, they became cooler, uh, they ran clearer, uh, the percentage of life was more diverse and greater, 
and he, he kind of went back and he, he studied it and he said, I, I, I think it's I think it's wolves. The only change that I can picture that's happened is the reintroduction of wolves. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at the wolves and he said, well, the wolves, uh, you know, keep the elk away from the streams uh, because they can patrol the streams fairly easily. Uh, the, the, the elk cannot eat the foliage and the foliage gets a chance to develop. So the trees grow, the trees grow, the beaver comes back, the beaver comes back. Uh, the water becomes more consistent because you have a dam or something. It becomes more consistent. The wildlife becomes, or, or the plant life becomes more diverse. Uh, and then you have, with, with the plant life becoming more diverse, you have more areas for natural filtering or filtering of the stream and hardening of the banks. Hardening is not the right word, but protection of the banks with, mm. uh, you know, root structures. And so he noticed that, that after a while, the introduction of wolves, um, uh, caused the streams to be clearer, to mm. be health healthier. I mean, that's kind of an anthropomorphic word, but uh, mm. they, they were, they were self-adapting and self-changing and they have the biodiversity. Whenever you have a rich biodiversity, uh, you have an area that is more resilient and more, more susceptible to change. You can handle change easier. If you have these mm. monocultures, as we know, you can't. But if you have a diversity, the greater, almost the greater diversity and the greater complexity you have in a system, the more resilient it is, and resilient being mm -hmm. that it's self-correcting, and it can evolve. It doesn't mean it stays the same, but it's self-correcting, and uh, it was wonderful. And so the the whole the whole idea of wolves and the reintroduction of wolves is a very positive thing. Now the ranchers are a little bit you know ticked off because uh, every once in a while a cow gets it, and my wife is a rancher, and mm. so she has concerns about that, but. Uh, there's a cost in removing the wolves. And the mm. cost is that maybe what you can do is you can have people be wolves and, you know, have everybody with their gun walk up and down the stream bank, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, twice a day uh, to keep the elk away and the deer away. And maybe, you know, that will solve the problem. And then you could, you know, but a wolf does a fantastic job of, you know, they may not eat a lot, but they certainly do a lot of scaring Mm -hmm. And they kind of uh, and we don't have to pay them. The we don't have to pay them. <laughs> so, uh, but that relationship, I think, is is what's really important. And when you talk about any stream, and you've talked about it, if if it's let, if you let it be, uh, you know, you, you can it's so, it, it 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 likes to be self correcting in the way that it has been. Now, we have some real changes with climate that are happening. Um, and uh, we can talk about those that we're now self-correcting into kind of a new, a new order, a new, new uh, uh, regime, a new domain. But uh, uh, we, we still have to allow it to self-correct. So I think if there's a rule of thumb and you mentioned it, just let the stream be. If you can, you have setback from it, let it be. And, uh, you know, try to uh, have a little, uh, you know, impact and footprint as you can and you have you know you do that and i as i said we'll put a hard piece of concrete if you put a, a concrete in the edge then you take the whole energy so if you put a lot like a, a some kind of a levee at the at one side of a river so now with all that energy is changing a river you can look at a river from a physics standpoint it was just an energy grade line so you've got all the water representing energy and when the energy you know is delayed in one area it doesn't go away laws of conservation of energy mm -hmm. just move someplace and so uh if you you know try to divert the energy and protect one area that energy is going to reappear downstream farther and so you protecting your home by putting a levy in has to absolutely the law of physics that energy has to go someplace else and that someplace else if you if you don't like them or that's okay that that erodes, uh, that's fine. But uh, you can kind of, if you just close your eyes, you sit by a river and kind of be the river, and you can kind of see that where the energy is going, and the energy is coming down, you can see it in the waves and the, the amount of water, and, uh, and it, it, uh, it, it's, it's, like, it's like a wave. It has uh, you know, troughs and uh, uh, 
So it, it's a wave from a horizontal standpoint. Just think of a, of a snake on the ground. Hmm. That river is a wave moving down. And it's also a wave hmm. the other way as, as it goes from, you know, from riffles runs to, you know, to, uh, to pools. It's a wave that way. And if you look at a drop of water in the headwaters of the stream, that drop of water before it reaches the Gulf, uh, you know, may go into the ground, may be in the, in the, in the water, may be in the stream, uh, may move way out into the edge of the, the plume of groundwater that uh, surrounds most streams if there's, you know, permeable soil. And so you've got all of this, this action going on, and you kind of have to be that. And uh, through you know time and space, and it's it's fun. I had a um, I had a Volkswagen in college, like everybody had a Volkswagen, right? <laughs> and so the Volkswagen uh, was the most simple engine. It had you know maybe I don't know twenty moving parts. I don't know. It had, <laughs> it, it had you know four cylinders, and it had a uh, you know some rings, and it had a uh, all that. And so there was a book that was written called uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Mm-hmm. And, and on the book, it showed a person in a yoga position in, in floral because it was the 60s, right, and 70s, <laughs> and thinking about the engine and just becoming the engine and tracing the engine and, and to find out the problem. Because with only 20 moving parts, the, the Volkswagen engine always had something that was stuck, and it had a third cylinder. If you've never worked on a Volkswagen engine. And it had that third cylinder on the left uh, inside and you know, toward the front that no air ever got to. <laughs> and so that always was, uh, you always had to replace that head or something. <laughs> but, but you know, you kind of think, and I, I've had my students do this, just sit by the river and don't say anything, just become the river and, and you know, trace a, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a piece of floating debris as it comes down. And then think about over time. And do the same with the shoreline. I mean, if you do a shoreline and you kind of, you know, there's a there's a literal drift along a shore. And so you, you watch the sediment come and go. And there's a summer winter effect in most shores. is, And there's a loss of sediment. So sediment has to, uh, you know, come from the land. And so those eroding bluffs provide the beaches that you have. And, you and really kind of, quickly, by literal drift, yeah. you mean like logs and stuff like that, right? No, literal drift on, on, along the coast is when you have a coastal uh, current that goes north south or it oh. goes along the, along the coast, and it uh, it brings sediment in, and uh, the beach kind of changes it, and so the sand is built up, and but that sand actually moves uh, onto the beach, off the beach, onto the beach, off the beach as it's deposited and eroded away, and it's it's called. Uh, and I'm not even sure if that's correct. It, it's, uh, it could be littoral drift, I guess. I've always called it a little, little bit. I'm from Chicago. And, <laughs> you know, I'll the, look it up and put it in the show notes for folks. Yeah, but but it, it's it's an interesting thing because the uh, all, you know, nature is very dynamic. It's changing. And right now as the climate is warming and we have all that extra energy in the atmosphere, that energy has to go someplace. And so you can – Basically, or at the most basic level, look at uh, the world uh, because the climate is is world is connected. Mm-hmm. So, a tree that you plant in Texas will have a positive effect on absorbing carbon in Bangladesh. I mean, it's we were all this one big system. But if you look at the heat that's the, that's remaining, you're just taking a rheostat. You're taking the volume knob of a radio and turning it up, and all that energy is now in, in, in our system, and that energy has to go someplace. The energy is either stored or it's doing something. Weather is something that it's doing. So you can actually trace, if you have a uh, anything, if you have a, a, a tree along the side of a levee, and that tree gets washed in. Well, that tree gets washed in because water eroded it. Water eroded it because it came upstream. It came upstream uh, because there's a reservoir or something upstream that produce the water. Well, it got in the reservoir because of rain or other streams. And it got it, rain, you know, fell because it it actually uh, was, a uh, you know, in the uh, the water, the moisture in the ocean, you know, reached the, uh, the, the sky and fell in. So as the, as the earth becomes hotter, you have the oceans becoming hotter, you have uh, the air around it becoming hotter, that absorbs more moisture. So you have more 
uh, you know, evaporation. You have more evaporation, you have more rain. So if you just look at that tree falling in, you can trace that back to climate very easily. And when you turn up the knob and increase the amount of energy in the system, all of a sudden you can say, well, the chances of that tree eroding now are, uh, you know, stronger and uh, hmm. than they were, you know, 10 years ago when we didn't have all that energy. So you can actually trace that energy. Uh, hmm. Energy is, mm -hmm. is uh, you know, second law of thermodynamics, or was <laughs> I the first. But uh, energy can change, just like you can take heat in a stove and make it steam, and then you can make that put that steam into a, a locomotive and make it mechanical, going back and forth to move the wheels. You can, you can put it through a, some kind of an alternator and make electricity out of it. Energy doesn't really stay there. It, it does something. It does work. And that work... Uh, you know, it could be a whole different kinds of things, but it's, you're just taking that rheostat with climate change and switching that puppy up and, you know, having more work done and more work is more weather or it's more erosion. It's more, it can even be more drought. Drought is that work, uh, you know, changes the Gulf Stream and moves it in a different direction. But, you know, so when now we have a situation where, uh, you know, the, the rivers want to be and they want to change and they're uh, they're going through a system uh, that was somewhat constant uh, over the last, you know, in, in the Northwest, I, I'm going to have to go back to the Northwest, but our streams um, have their roots in 13,000 years ago because the glaciers retreated mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So generally, if you look at our landscape, you look at during that period is when you kind of say they were cyclical. Well, now uh, they're they're changing. They're not becoming cyclical. They're actually changing into a new, a new system because the climate is warming. So here we have in the, in the Northwest in beautiful downtown Seattle, we have uh, streams that come off the Cascades. The Cascades are fairly low mountains, four and 5,000, 6,000 feet. And those mountains, you know, we have a lot of rain in Seattle. Okay. In case, case, case you have not heard. <laughs> And in the winter, our streams are, are fairly, fairly heavy. They're big flows in. But some of that, some of that rain falls as snow. And then during the summer in, uh, in, uh, you know, June and July, we get a second peak for the streams. So they're usually always full. We're, we're now having a period where it's not falling as snow. It's running off. So we're having bigger flows, uh, larger flows in, in the winter months. And some of our streams are, are, are looking like they're going to become intermittent in the summer. Hmm. Well, all of a sudden, you know, the biology of those streams and not just, you know, the zoology, but, but the plants and everything were used to that, those two cycles. They, 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 that summer melt provided water, uh, in the spring. And, uh, <clears throat> that's when you have the rejuvenation. And, and so our, our mountains are, are tending to die now as things are becoming hotter. Hmm. And then I can put on top of that fire. Uh, we have, uh, you know, Australia is having these huge fires that is one, I mean, nobody in the scientific community does not feel that those are, there's, I think, three, three, three negatives in that, but uh, that, the, uh, that the Australian fires are not climate change related. Our fires up here are, are climate change related. Not that they never have before, but they're happening with greater consistency because, again, that energy has to go someplace. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's just transferred. It comes from the sun. It's here. It, it's trapped with the greenhouse gases. Now we have all that energy. I guess the positive thing is that um, you could make use of that. I mean, if you have uh, that energy will be more wind in areas. It'll be more rain in areas. It'll be more sunlight in some areas. Uh, or hotter in some areas, not more sunlight, and you can convert that to energy. And so I guess as we have more energy in the atmosphere, we can convert more of that energy to fit our needs. So that may be a positive thing. Hmm. So, uh, but I think what I, I, to put a conclusion on this, you know, let streams be, they'll kind of self-correct and they'll kind of, uh, you know, go back to uh, a system of, of uh, a dynamic system that kind of, replenishes themselves and uh, corrects the self-correcting. However, as the climate is changing, that self-correcting uh, may be to a different 
a different regime. And it may have a, a I mean, there's a long-term effect. When you look at uh, the, the very disturbing part is when you look at uh, ice, the ice sheet is melting. And so we, we had a lot of sunlight uh, hit the ice fields, the sea ice, and reflect that back out of the Earth's atmosphere. Well, now as it's becoming warmer, we have less ice. The less ice we have, the less reflection. The less reflection, the hotter it gets. The hotter it gets, uh, the more ice melts. The more ice melts, uh, the less reflection. The less reflection, the hotter it gets, the more ice melts. <laughs> and so, and you have, but you have to, and then, if you go down to permafrost, the <clears throat> permafrost is releasing, releasing methane. And so the more methane is released, that's a greenhouse gas, the hotter it gets. The hotter it gets, the more methane is released. The more methane is released, the hotter it gets. And if you look at our forest fires, our forests were always, uh, they, they sequestered carbon. So the trees are carbon. And so uh, when, we, when, they, when they burn, they actually release carbon. So the more forest fires we have, the hotter it gets, the more carbon in the atmosphere, the more carbon in the atmosphere, the more reflection uh, down to the earth, the hotter it gets, the more forest fires we have. So we have all of these cycles. I haven't even talked about bare earth or the ocean yet. But all yeah, of these that stuff is complicated and complex as hell. It's, but, but it's not. It, it, it's not <laughs> complex. It's, it, it's, these are just reinforcing loops. You can understand this. You know, uh, I think a fourth grader can understand this. If you have, if you have, take permafrost. If you have permafrost and it's melting, it's releasing methane, the methane will make things hotter. The hotter they get, the more methane would, would be released. And you have a reinforcing loop in a negative sense. And I think that it's that's very easy to understand. I don't think that's complex. You start to put numbers to it, it tends to be kind of complex. And also, one system reacts to the other system, and that mm -hmm. can be complex. Right. But, yeah. but I, I think that um, uh, it's 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 uh, to me it's very easy to understand. If you look at uh, just the basic laws of thermodynamics, you'll have a, a standing of how we are going really from one system fairly uh, self-correcting uh, system, we're going from that to something that is totally new and is not self-correcting. And, uh, you know, whether we can change it or back or not, I think there's still, uh, this, it's still out on that. I think that if we hold back carbon, since we produce the carbon that was the trigger to this, if we start to hold back that carbon, I think we can stop some of those thresholds from being reached. But we have uh, we have positive signs. I mean, we have British Petroleum in our paper in Seattle. We have a big uh, British Petroleum plant. Uh, they are saying that they want that they are going to support carbon, uh, uh, you know, carbon uh, uh, programs to uh, uh, to put cost on carbon. And also, Shell is doing the same thing. So they're they're within 20 years. They say that they're going to try to go out of the fossil fuel industry hmm. slowly, and they are going to start to capture uh, new economies. However, we have a, a you know a, a government currently that is uh, I've never seen anything like this sticking their head in the sign. If I I had a uh, an uncle, so I had a I love my uncle, and he we used to play scrap. <clears throat> And so, and he was, uh, he was, uh, he was Danish. He was from Denmark and he was really obstinate. I'm not going to make any more generalization than that. <laughs> but so, so this one time we were paying Scrabble and there's this one word that came up and I can't remember if I said the word or my father said the word, we play together as a family, but he said, that's not a word. And so, well, we, you know, go to the dictionary. And so he went to the dictionary and he saw the word and he, he tore the page out <laughs> and he said, it doesn't exist. The word doesn't exist. I've dealt with people like that before. And so, you know, so fine. I guess if you want to deal with climate change and say, you know, things are not happening when they're happening all around you. I mean, at some point, the you know, the, the king has no clothes. And so, uh, but I'll ask you to, you know, uh, ask other questions. We're kind of getting on a, uh, a tirade here. It's all right. It's like. It's kind of where we're here for a guest to talk. It's not it's not my show. If it was just me, then it'd just be me talking the whole time. But hear people what people have to say about climate, ecology, make connections, 
Um, you know, and it's one good thing people will get to hear about in the podcast is relationship between creeks and climate, not just take it out of context. Um, more things to consider. Um, but so with the stuff you said, um, so you think it'd be instead of being better, like, oh, the creek might be maybe there's more rain and it's not self-correcting as much. So um, some people might think we got to put concrete down now because things have changed and um, we got to control it and it's out of control. But you think that that's actually would be wrong. And it's the opposite that we need to plant more trees and let it release energy through all these different mechanisms by keeping right. it natural. There's there a, a, a you, you kill Peter to save Paul. So mm -hmm. any, if that energy is coming down the stream and you put a piece of concrete in it and it hits that piece of concrete, there's a cost someplace. You know, when you make a change in one area, you make a change in another area because that energy doesn't stop at that, you know, that bulkhead you put in or that foundation for a building you put in that goes farther downstream. And, and it can, uh, I mean, it's, everything's connected to everything else. So uh, I'm not against concrete, I guess. I mean, concrete, you know, produces a lot of carbon in its making, but it, it certainly lasts for a long time. Mm -hmm. But even though the concrete lasts for a long time, in these very dynamic environments, such as stream beds and alluvial areas and beaches, uh, the, the actual beach will not last as long as that structure will last. And uh, that structure will have a, an effect on that beach for a long period of time. And it, it's well known, if you, if you have a, a beach that has any energy at all, and you put in a bulkhead, uh, that sand in front of the bulkhead is going to disappear. <laughs> the, the, the waves are going to come in. Uh, it's going to concentrate that energy uh, and, and remove it. And so you protected your home. Uh, you've lost the beach. You may have moved there from the beach, but you, <laughs> yeah, right. but, you know, but you protected your home. And okay, that's the cost. If you want to do that, that's fine. But you're probably for, you know, hurting somebody else. Well, what's the recourse? Well, you you set back, but then how about all that land? You know, and and there also is, uh, you know, there are a lot of environmental engineers that are going to question what I say because they. There's there's some systems where they think they know, and I think they probably do. They know that if you do put a bulkhead in or you put in a piece of concrete, you can deflect the energy in such a way that it caused no harm or will cause uh, a beneficial element. So if you put a – you have a stream flowing down and you put in a, a piece of concrete that deflects the <coughs> – uh, you know, the water away from your side of the stream to the other side of the stream, uh, you know, that can be considered okay uh, if you want to make a deposition area on the other side of the stream. You know, I mean, you just you, you just can't look at uh, where you're putting that concrete. Again, you've got that whole energy environment that you have to trace where that's going and you know, there are a ton of models that do that, but you can't, uh, you can't not ignore it. I, and I, the other thing is that you have, the team has to be fairly large. One, one, uh, you know, an easy course is to let the stream be and kind of do what you want it, what, what it wants to do. And then once you kind of understand the way it's going, you can kind of build around it. Mm -hmm. But if you do, you know, try to direct that energy and do something that is a uh, little, you know, with a, a little bigger footprint, then you really have to have a bunch of specialties and you, you have to have, uh, you know, people that understand the geology. So you need a stream morphologist. You have to have, have people understand the flow characteristics. So you need somebody to do some hydraulic modeling. You, you, you need a, a biologist because you have to know generally uh, the self-correcting nature of plants and root systems and how that's going mm -hmm. to affect mm -hmm. You have to know, uh, you know, what, what the bio, what, what the zoology is because those plants are dependent upon the zoology uh, for, you know, for seed dispersal and all that. So as soon as you start monkeying around, because we thought as a country, here's a, here's a story. There's a great book uh, called Rising Tide about the Mississippi. And again, I can't think of the author and it's a great book and I'm not doing him any credit by saying that. But uh, so in the, in the, you know, the 1860s and before all the uh, logs from Iowa and, uh, and the grain uh, went on a one-way trip. To New Orleans, 
because you couldn't really get up the Mississippi. So they would build a barge and they would uh, fill it full of grain from Iowa and Illinois and uh, Minnesota. I think Minnesota is not too far up and they would float it down. And then when they got the grain down there, they would uh, sell it and they would uh, sell, then sell the boat for lumber. Hmm. And then uh, paddle wheels kind of came about and steam. And then they kind of worked their way up the stream. So now you could actually bring it down and bring it back up. But the, the Mississippi was always changing. And so you had areas that were deep. Uh, you had areas that were shallow. And those were changed because rivers, you know, change from side to side as they meander. They also change in terms of, uh, you know, riffles, pools and runs and, uh, you know, the bed of the river changes. And so they were saying, my gosh, all that change is caused by, uh, you know, all these trees are coming in. They're, they're calling these, they're, they're, these tree roots are coming in and they're stopping the drainage of the river. So what we're going to do is get rid of those snags. So they got rid of the snags and that didn't really help. They said, well, by gosh, you know, those snags are coming from trees. So if we just get the trees down, we don't have trees along the Mississippi. We're not going to have snags. If we don't have snags, we're not going to have a sediment pile up. Well, what that happened is they t- they took the trees out, and it released all that sediment. Now the sediment well, was totally filled, and they said, "Okay, well, I guess what we'll do now is we'll we'll make a levee. And we if we make a levee and confine the the river, it's got to go faster, because when you confine it, that energy is now between you know between let's say uh, half a mile and a mile. So you concentrate that energy, and it's got to wash that sediment out. Well, then they committed themselves to making levees." on the whole Mississippi River. Hmm. And when they're there, if they had, uh, you know, if they, if they had just let it be, they could have worked themselves around it and had much less, I think, of a, uh, of a long-term impact. We now have a dead zone outside of the Gulf, uh, outside of New Orleans, a huge dead zone, because hmm. there's not that natural riparian filter, uh, that used to be there. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, here you're, you're killing Peter to save Paul. So if you look at the cost of levees and the cost of, of that dead zone and the cost of the adverse effects of that river, uh, you know, yeah. And there was a film out and I, I wish I had the film. I, the film has been destroyed uh, mm-hmm. by the Corps and I, I don't think it was maliciously destroyed, but it was called Taming the Tiger. And it was by a bunch of engineers, the Corps of Engineers, and I love the Corps. They do some great, great work. But this film said, by gosh, we have tamed the Mississippi River. It no longer floods like it used to. We are in control of the Mississippi River. <laughs> and that, the whole purpose of the film was it was a big salesmanship. And so uh, it just, uh, you know, sometimes we build a hammer. And we look around for a nail. So we have this tool to, that we think we can control the river with, the levee. So by gosh, we got to use it. So, hmm. it's too bad. Yeah. Good. Well, I, I think the most absurd uh, example of that is for my generation is that after we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we had, uh, you know, military bombs. And so, uh, I think the people that made them, William Teller and, uh, uh, Oppenheimer and the rest thought that, my gosh, that's a bad thing. We just killed a bunch of people. But there has to be a good part of the, of this, of the bomb. So they developed a program that was well funded, several, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars every year called, uh, plowshares in which they were going to turn the bomb into something positive. And so what can you do with the bomb? Well, damn it, we need another, uh, Panama Canal. And so they had actually, worked up a system where they could detonate bombs across the isthmus of Panama. Hmm. They, had, they had a whole plan called, I think, Chariot, Chariot uh, Project Chariot in Alaska, where they were going to create a harbor in Alaska in a historical Indian area, uh, uh, an Inupic, uh, uh First Nations area, uh, with five nuclear bombs. I mean, and they downplayed the radiation. But here they had they had a hammer, and by gosh, there's got, you know, we're looking for a nail. We got this atomic bomb. By gosh, you know, let's use that puppy. You know, we have these models. By gosh, these models have to work. And I, the best answer is just 
to go back, look at the river and say that, you know, the river wants to be a certain way going back and forth. And when you intrude, you intrude comprehensively and you have to look at the, you know, if you're killing Peter by putting that concrete there, it's going to affect Paul. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to somewhat, uh, you know, be the river and kind of figure out where it's going. And I'm not saying you can't build along a river. I'm a boater. I like to have marinas. But every time you have a hard edge or every time you have a hard, uh, you know, a, a very demanding footprint, you're going to have some problem someplace else. Yeah, it reminds me. I think another example might be um, wanting to control things like that. Um, I think a long time ago, people were more comfortable, understood human nature better. So they were fine with letting kids run around and play. But now yeah. it's like we got to control them. And then there's all these problems that just snowball from there. And then you have to try to come up with other controls like, oh, we're going to take away their recess. Oh, and then some kid acts up just like a river acting up. Yeah. And instead of like and then they blame it on the kid and beat them or whatever and try to like make them do what they want. Instead of grasping, oh, we are the ones that are wrong. The kids just acting according to their nature and doing what should be done and what humans have done for millennia. Okay, how can we adjust and be consistent with nature, with children? Um, you know, we should do that too. Um, same thing with the rivers. But yeah, there's like all these problems kids have nowadays. Um, it's not necessary. It's not um, genetic. It's bad ideas yeah. in the culture trying to control yeah. and make reality conform to us instead of whatever we want instead of submitting to the laws of the world and realizing this is what we got to do like it or not and, and then letting kids fail yeah and say they're letting them fall down it's just <laughs> letting them just it's it's it has to happen now the fall is tends to be people it's bigger now i guess but it's always been, it's always been big. And, uh, so, and I, 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 I mean, I, I have to really do a better job of teaching this that, uh, you know, the, that, you know, uh, uh, a bad result is a result that's just as, as good as a good result. Mm -hmm. that, that's really just the sound correct. But, uh, anyway, I, I, people have to fail. Fail is a part of learning. And if you fail on the small ones, you may not, you know, fail on the big ones. Yeah. You, and then you, you can do that. I think people need to look at the bigger picture of instead of looking at something as failure or an injury. Well, when they only do that, when they think too narrowly, too much in isolation, they're missing the bigger picture of how a kid is learning to um, identify and control risk. What can they do and what they cannot do? Yep. Kind of like putting concrete in. A problem a lot of people do, the way they control streams, is looking at stuff in isolation. Um, we, we up here, uh, our solution, you know, I mean, you can. there's kind of a joke with this, but I don't know what the question is about the stream, but the answer is large woody debris. And so uh, <laughs> we, put, we put large woody debris everywhere because uh, it doesn't come down naturally. And it's a little softer and looks nicer than concrete. Mm, yeah, but it, it is a control, and it, it does take a lot of engineering to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, but again, we have we have uh, homes along the sides of uh, of watercourses, and so if that river is meandering, uh, you know, then you have to say, okay, we've got all this development we have to protect. And even though it may be wiser and more cost effective just to move that development on the other side for a while. We don't have the tools or the culture to do that where, uh, you know, our native brothers and sisters did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so. Uh, that's one know, thing that's kind that's of important. ironic, too, as how some people look at us as all advanced. And in some ways we are. In some ways the culture is great, but not in every way. I think some so-called primitive cultures <laughs> have some much yeah. better ideas and are much more advanced in some things than we are today. Well, and I think they're becoming disconnected also in a way. But I think that yeah. uh, if you look at, uh, you know, before a white man came with the, just the tribes and how they uh, lived with their environment, they certainly understood it. They were a part of it. And we are we've lost that connection. Somehow we think that uh, 
uh, you know, an urban area is, is fixed. It's not self-correcting. It's amazing. And we really have to have wonder and awe when we go out to the forest and say, look, at this area is self-correcting. This area is living and it's, and it's self-correcting. And uh, it's changing. And uh, our cities are not. When we have coastal cities, they're now being encroached by uh, rising seas and infiltration of all of their pipes by, uh, you know, acidic water now. Uh, they're going to have to move. These cities, coastal areas are going to have to move. And then they're going to have to move again. Then they're going to have to move again. Uh, <clears throat> how do we build environments that are self-correcting? I mean, if, if we have areas here that are uh, the uh, some farms next to our oceans that are becoming alkaline and uh, are becoming, uh, so as the salt water rises, uh, the, the, the soils are becoming alkaline, more alkaline. And uh, they're just, they're having a very, very difficult time uh, kind of adjusting to that. Well, that's going to be that way. So maybe that land should be land for an urban area for a while until the seas become too high. And areas that are now in development that were prime farmlands next to river should, is where the farmland should be. And so, uh, and we've talked about transfer development rights and all sorts of ways of moving, uh, moving property and having a little more flexibility in our, our built uh, environment. Uh, but we have a long way to go. We have yeah. a long way to go. The, the, the best plan, I think, is, is kind of one of your neighbors or sort of one of your neighbors. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, you know, I mean, I, so Tampa has, has a, Tampa's not one of your neighbors. <laughs> no. Anyway, I mean, but when you look from up here in Seattle down there, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, so Tampa has a great little plan. As the seas rise, uh, they have these priority redevelopment areas and the storms occur where increases in density will be set farther back from the water course. And those areas close to the water will remain their densities, have lower densities. And as they sort of uh, lose their functionality because of raising seas, those development rights will be moved farther inland. Hmm. Now, I, don't, I, I think they have the priority redevelopment areas. I don't know if they've adopted the development right part of it. But uh, there are places that are toying with the idea of making environments that are flexible. Hmm, interesting. And, and uh, you know, I, structures that are, you know, somewhat uh, somewhat uh, complementary to uh, the changing landscapes that are occurring, not just because of climate change, they've always occurred, but are certainly we're upping the rheostat in terms of the level of change and speed of change because of our changing climate. And then, yeah, you know, it's like, instead of trying to have something fixed and expecting to dictate to reality or nature the way it should behave, um, which isn't going to happen. Nature no. adapts. Things evolve. We got evolution, adaptation in the world. Um, we got, we got our, you know, then we, we have earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, reminding us of that fact. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it'd be better if we learned. But we also have a tree. We also yeah. have a tree. The, the, you know, the tree is breathing. The tree is growing another tree. The tree is self-correcting. The tree is, we, we can just marvel at a tree. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's certainly a way to be connected, uh, within your own environment. And I, there's a whole, bunch of research being done on trees, not just because they, they sequester carbon, um, but uh, they do a lot of things. I mean, mm -hmm. trees in a watershed, you know, the root systems cleanse the water, they filter it, they create habitat for other things. So, uh, and they're, uh, you know, trees stay there for a while, so you can kind of plant around them. Um, at least your time horizons are a little larger than if it was just grasses. <clears throat> but I think that... Uh, you know, trees, healthy forests do not burn with the same intensity that unhealthy ones do. Yeah, right. So. And how can, um, like, what are some ways that people could decrease the destruction, decrease the hazards and risks of living along a creek? Because, you know, like ours, as I say, we've had Hurricane Harvey, major rainfall, 
And there's, no. so there's necessarily going to be some flooding, no matter how much concrete, more than usual, but we've had some flooding before that. So, so what are some ways that um, the, ha the hazards and risks along the creek could be minimized? Well, I mean, there are hazards to the creek and then the hazards of the creek to us, I guess. Uh, obviously, the hazards for to the creek are just, you know, when you don't let the natural um, uh, diversity and complexity of the stream kind of rule and let it kind of be. Uh, you know, try to control that. That's certainly hazard when you, you know, put pollutants into it. In terms of the stream to us, uh, I think that we have to uh, look at ways that we can have the lightest footprint possible. I mean, there are, uh, I think there are ways, you know, to elevate homes on piles and stilts to, that may be better. Uh, even floating environments may be better than, uh, you know, concrete hmm. uh, that make impermeable areas. Where there's a whole, there's a whole uh, uh, discussion of LID. LID means local improvement district, but it also means low impact development where you can have permeable development that has the a built environment that has the characteristics of a meadow hmm. in terms of its ability to absorb water. And uh, I think they work very well in certain areas. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and they have a little more flexibility, uh, but they are still uh, not dynamic. I mean, they're not self-correcting environments. Um but they have a, a certainly a smaller footprint. We have permeable, you have forest, you have swales, you have permeable soils, or permeable uh, infrastructure that even though you're living in a house that may be of concrete, the environment has the same hydraulic characteristics as a meadow. And there's been some success with that in areas near, near the servers. And I don't think it's any more expensive. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but um, it's certainly different. And also having homes that are mobile. I mean, you can have, uh, uh, I mean, in areas that have a tremendous problem, such as Bangladesh, uh, with sea level rise and increase in storms, uh, there's a whole uh, community that are starting to build on, with schools and everything, on floating platforms. Hmm. The Dutch are doing this on floating platforms, on, and also uh, amphibious homes that, Areas that are normally dry but can become wet, and when they become wet, the homes float up, and when instead of putting them on stilts, they float. But these are mm -hmm. these are all attempts uh, to create a, a dynamic built environment in a, a, a dynamic natural environment, and how you can kind of uh, reminds me of uh, I don't know why this came up. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember Cassius Clay. Uh, Muhammad Ali in, uh, uh, oh, I, was just, I think I think it was the uh, Rumble in the Jungle against Foreman, where he went into Rope-A-Dope. Does that ring a bell at all to you? Uh, so Muhammad, Muhammad Ali was getting older. Yeah. And so uh, what he did is he decided that what he would do is wear the other opponents out, off. So what he did, he allowed himself to be hit. But what he did is he hung along the ropes. Hmm. And it was, it was brilliant from a physics standpoint. <laughs> so as, as, the, as he was hit, the energy was absorbed in the rope. Huh, wow. Hmm. So it, it, it was like he was in a huge slingshot. And uh, in a way he was hit, he went back and he was absorbed in the rope. And uh, he could withstand a tremendous amount of blows because if I would hit you, which I wouldn't do, mainly because you <laughs> hit me back, but you would, you would stiffen up, right? If I hit you in the stomach, you would stiffen your stomach, and you'd probably lean forward in the punch. Mm -hmm. That's a natural reaction. But what he did is he leaned up against the rope, and when he was hit, the rope absorbed the energy. He kind of relaxed, and he won the fight because hmm. he had energy toward the end when, he, when his opponent – uh, had uh, you know completely become exhausted, wow. beating the heck out of them. Interesting. And, and so, but again, it, it just psychologically, how do we how do we have a an environment, uh, a built environment that we can live in uh, that can 
take advantage of basic physics and live in a, a world that's changing and a landscape that's changing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the, always been our big question. Uh, and, but, but, but communities change. Communities, communities change because they modernize. They change because the, uh, you have additional people that go in. Communities can adapt. Maybe we, maybe we don't have, uh, property rights. We don't have property rights that are assigned to a piece of property. You buy a property right, and that right, uh, can be used anywhere. You still own property, own your house, but as the, as the stream changes and as it washes away or as you have increasing flooding and, and, and the area you're living in is good for the next 20 years and the sea level rise is going to take it away, maybe you, you have a 20 year life for your house and you have, you buy a property right and, uh, you live in that house for 20 years and have your grandkids come to the beach. But then, uh, if it, if it, uh, if it washes away in a storm and the seas are, are going to rise to take it over, you transfer that development right someplace else. Interesting. Hmm. Or maybe you buy buildings with life cycle costs. In Hawaii, uh, I was looking at Hawaii. So I lived in Hawaii for a while, which we didn't go into. And I lived for about <laughs> seven years. And right cool. along Wa Waikiki Beach, down the beach, there's uh, uh, Kapiolani Park. And no, it was Kapiolani Park. It's been a long time. But anyway, there's a large park right between uh, uh, Diamond Head and between Waikiki. Uh, anyway, I think that's the feel on it. Anyway, in front of it are a bunch of condos, and the condos we were looking at, they were in the, in the, in the $400,000, $500,000 range. Well, Hawaii on the coast? Well, hmm. they were that range because they had leasehold interests that were going to be up in 20 years, 15 years. Well, actually, that's fine for me. I don't, I don't think I'm probably going to be living 20 years from now. <laughs> yeah. And so, but for my kids to come, that's a perfect thing. And so maybe we have uh, areas that are built up in transitional zones because of climate where you have, uh, uh, you know, people having the, the, the life cycle of the building uh, is commensurate with the life cycle of that piece of property being able to uh, have that have that building on it <clears throat> and <clears throat> so you know in 20 years uh the lease is up the 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 uh, part of my money to my taxes goes to destroying the building that now becomes a beach uh and uh because the seas are high you don't have to build you know more and more infrastructure to keep the water out and maybe that works in that case or maybe you have a person who lives along the beach and they don't own the land of the beach. They have a right to that beach for 20 years, but that, that right can be transferred someplace else. It can be sold on the market. Hmm. Uh, and the whole idea of transfer and purpose and purchase of development rights can be looked at kind of globally. But we have to, because we have, you know, pick a number, $33 billion going to the New York Times assets uh, that are going to be. Uh, extremely vulnerable in the next 20 years because of sea level rise and increased storms that are going to be beyond the limits of tolerance, risk tolerance for the people that are there or not. And so how do you, how do you move those structures? The government's not going to buy them all. Uh, insurance companies are very wise to this. They're not going to buy them. I spoke before an insurance commissioner and insurance companies uh, don't assume risk. They transfer risk. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so how, how do you do that? Well, I think we have to look at buildings with, with shorter life cycles. We have to look at transfer development rights. We have to look at temporary structures. We have to look at mobile structures uh, because we're not going to be able to build historically when we had a stable environment. The climate change was making what we thought was, you know, cyclically stable, dynamically stable, dynamic, stable stability into something that's not, something that is changing. And we're going to have to kind of uh, address that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, can, cool. it doesn't have to be arduous. I mean, we, we have to stop climate change, but think of all the problems we have we can address. Think of all the new building and the new jobs that you can have. Think of the worst thing you can do is just say, I'm going to try to rebuild the infrastructure of the 1950s. Uh, but if you start to look at uh, all sorts of things. You look at uh, structures that are mobile. You look at, uh, you know, making uh, uh, smaller utility districts or uh, utility districts that are uh, 
you know, have a, a, a micro scale and have uh, wind and solar combined and you look at uh, all these things for a new environment, it can be a, a wonderful thing. Not as good as we've had it before, maybe in terms of opportunity, but it doesn't have to be, you know, we can, we have to do it. We don't have a choice. Yeah, I think it'd be good if we'd advance more and have um, more ideas of adaptation and evolution have that um, more influencing the way we think about cities and design instead of seems like the way people wear shoes and high heels and sometimes it's fine. Yeah. Um, but they also deform our structure and our feet. And some of that seems to come and like putting shoes on horses. Some of that seems to come from wanting to um, be like the nobility of the Europeans, big, yeah. huge um, Versailles and palaces and um, the pyramids of Egypt. And, oh, we got to have stuff that lasts forever and dominates the environment. But we'd be better off if we thought like uh, the peasants or some of the others and thinking and not trying to like dominate others, but having adaptive structures, um, working with the environment, working with other people instead of trying to dominate people and tell them what to do and tell reality what to do. Yeah. So I hope this was helpful. Anything yeah. you, you haven't. <laughs> and, 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 your, and your question. You opened you up asking, a lot, whole new horizons. Well, well and, and, and you're questioning, uh, before for, for your podcast or viewership, you you wanted me. You gave a list of things you wanted to discuss. I don't think we've discussed any of them. But <laughs> that's all uh, right. It was like that's how it goes. Sometimes you know you don't know where discussions going to go. The one thing you, it was failure. You asked me to talk about failure, and so part of my my teaching are all the failures I've done while I was working. So that's that's <laughs> that's part of it. So, but I was thinking what my my biggest failure was, and I think it. Wasn't listening. I think that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had. I, so we spent a lot of money uh, when I was with FEMA on moving two Alaskan villages, uh, huh. and, and uh, you know from a river, and we did it because their old village was flooding, and so we moved the structures up on a hill. We had a winter camp to do it. It was very very expensive, uh, but there was no alternative. We thought. Uh, the river was changing course, and there was a hill. Well, when we moved them on the hill, uh, they were disconnected to the river. And here was a culture of uh, there, uh, some were Athabascan, some were in a Yupik. One side of the river was Athabascan, one was in a Yupik. And uh, we just didn't listen. They, they have slowly moved down there and spent most of their time, I think, in, in kind of fishing camp communities uh, along the river. And areas and, and, and structures that, that are mobile, and uh, it just it seems like a waste of money. You know what we should have done is said we want to ignore our culture. We want to go to their culture, and we were bound by, uh, for instance, HUD regulations. So the homes we had to build in Alaska in the rural villages had to be fitting of HUD requirements because we were using HUD money in codes and uh, cultures that. Uh, were developed from Chicago. I mean, it just, uh, and I think if we listened, we could have done something that was more attuned to their culture, more flexible and adaptable to the, that dynamic environment, environment they're in, instead of trying to force a fixed village on extremely uh, dynamic river and river that is just meandering all over the place, sediment rich. So, uh, I think that list and I, in many other areas where I think I may, if I would have just set back and put myself out of my culture and step back to look at it from, you know, a couple thousand feet and listened, mm -hmm. listened intensely. I think that, uh, you know, my, my German, uh, you know, stiff background <laughs> nature would have been a little more Italian. No, I think we got way back in history. We got, the same stuff way back in us if we just reconnect, you know, adaptation, getting along, connecting with nature. It's just kind yep. of lost through some, like, bad aspects of the culture. Great aspects of the culture, but there are some, but there are also some not-so-good aspects. But and, yeah. and we had to figure out how to reconnect, like, like you're saying. How do we get our students out there to 
enjoy and feel and understand that it's okay to be cold. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be without water for a while. It's okay to, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just life is, is, you know, this is part of life and it's, it's beautiful. And the, just to understand and internalize uh, that uh, forests, you know, change and they, and they change for a good reason and they, they evolve and they develop and if, and they, as I said, self-correct and self-organize. Uh, just to understand that whole natural evolutionary process uh, and feel it. And I think it, I think I'm going to do that more. I think I'm going to actually put in another field trip in our class nice. and require them to, well, that, maybe that's wrong. That's my German. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, you're going to be graded, graded for enjoying the environment. You know, you to, you <laughs> yeah. know, if you really enjoy it, you get an A. If you sort of enjoy it, you get a B. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that listening idea is good. Um, I think a lot of people need to learn how to listen better. Just like some cultures have said, you know, they got a saying, um, we got one mouth and two ears for a reason. We should listen twice as much as we talk yeah. <laughs> or more. But yeah, it's all over. Just listening to people in general and then applies to nature too. Um, don't try to tell it what to do. Try to start listening, so to speak, to what it's telling you. No, I think that's that's great. I mean, that's a great uh, conclusion. Cool. <laughs> uh, but we don't have to conclude. I, I do have a meeting, uh, you know, in another fifteen minutes or so. Ah, oh yeah, okay. Well, to, but but did you want to continue longer? Um, or maybe if we could pick up another day, that'd be great. Okay. Why why don't why don't you see what kind of questions people have? And cool. this this is kind of in a stream of consciousness. I'm not too sure. Uh, if we stayed on one topic at all, but uh, it's uh, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Awesome. Me too. Thanks. Okay. So thanks for being willing to talk. And um, any last words? Or we already summed up pretty well for folks. Oh, I think we did too. I think cool. uh, maybe <clears throat> for all of our parents, uh, <clears throat> us parents and grandparents, just uh, take the kids to the woods mm. <clears throat> and let them fall down. Yeah. True. True. So nice. All right, so hope you enjoyed that, folks. A lot of good food for thought there, getting deeper, getting philosophical, making some good connections there. Way beyond what um, you might have expected or what I was like thinking we'd talk about. So it was a great discussion. But uh, hope you enjoyed it, and we will talk to you all soon, folks. Thanks. Bye. Michael, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this a lot. Awesome.